I think we'll start here. Um, my name's Charles Godfrey. I'm the director of the Oxford Martin School, the building you're in, and delighted to see you all here. Um, now, you saw in the previous chair, Chaz, one of the nicest people who's just very friendly. And I have had very, very strict orders to be completely medieval with timing for the really important reason, if we don't get to Bailey or for lunch at the time we said we would, they're likely not to serve us lunch. So with no further ado, do, I'd like to uh, introduce Lord O'Neill, Jim O'Neill, who's had an extraordinary career in government and in the private sector, and of course is very well known for his 2016 report on AMR, AMR which Janet referred to earlier. Jim. <laughs> no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> um, I shall adjust further how I was going to do this uh, to try and minimise time and maybe a minute or so for somebody to ask or put me right, which is usually the case. Um, so where are we now? Uh, not in a very good place, uh, is my candid assessment six years later. Um, I'm linked to the mood of bits of what was said towards the end of that last panel, which I managed to get hit for. Lots of never-ending talk, uh, but not much action. And we do need AMR, definitely uh, irrelevant of whether it's the right name or not, it definitely needs its own Greta Thunberg in order to shake people up. On the name itself, um, halfway through our review, welcome who financed our review and housed my team, uh, as some of you probably know, adopted uh, a new language themselves and tried to persuade us to. And I said, don't be stupid. Um, and they were really annoyed that our review, with the name of the AMR review, got a lot more attention than they thought, and we ignored their wonderful guidance. So I think, it's, as I just joked with Jim Ratcliffe, in my view, and I couldn't, I couldn't pronounce antimicrobial resistance for weeks after I became the head of the review, uh, it's a bit like knowing that GDP isn't the greatest measure of things that matter to us all, but it's better than anything else. And in my view, that is definitely the case with AMR. Not least because, uh, as our important guest from WHO pointed out, it's pretty complicated stuff. And it's not just about antibiotics, although obviously it's the biggest bit. Anyhow, uh, some bullet points. So, very interesting uh, piece of research come out this week, which we'll come back to in a second. But the reason why our review sort of had a lot of noise is, of course, because in the very first paper we said, if we don't do something about it, 10 million people will die and will be accumulated loss of $100 trillion by 2050. As I hope most of you know, and I presume it's been discussed by others, apologies I wasn't there last night, earlier today, a very detailed report, the so-called Graham Report, earlier this year, five years worth of uh, intense data study, showed that actually the number of people that were directly dying was 1.27. We assumed it was 700,000. Uh, that's directly, and if it's indirectly, more than 4 million. So uh, you don't need a PhD in maths, but if you do a linear progression of that, all those people that said we were exaggerating by 10 million, actually, the linear progression of that is 31 million. So uh, it's pretty bad. And I'm sure you all, those of you who are experts, can find plenty of places around the world. India is the one that constantly comes out increasingly worrying to me about the scale of the problem and its growth. Um, on some specifics, where the talk is particularly never ending and drives me completely insane, and I've been involved in a number of things in my life where people, including us economists, like to talk a lot, uh, is of course the issue of new antibiotics and the pharmaceutical world waking up. In this regard, if none of you have heard of it yet or seen it, coincidentally, there's a very interesting paper just published by the Center for Global Development, uh, which effectively assumes that if a version of our market entry reward idea, by the way, I'm assuming most people here are broadly familiar with what the AMR review had to say, because I don't have time to go into it, but they, it's so-called Netflix model, which is what you could describe as what the UK has been trialing, uh, was done uh, somehow miraculously, collectively. The key part of why this is useful, they've estimated what the return on investment would be. And for the US, 28 to 1 uh, over 30 years. And for the world, 125 to 1. 
and uh, linked to it, and again, I don't have time to go into it, um, one of the core problems about this, uh, other than its name and its positioning, is a lot of the existing uh, institutional players in health kind of want to own too much of where they are. And they need to get finance more into the center. And it's not just, in my opinion, to do with AMR, it's to do with global health more importantly. One of the most interesting things I did the last couple of years was be on the so-called Monty Commission, an independent commission of WHO Europe in response to COVID about trying to make the world a better place. And we had uh, what we thought was complete agreement from within the G7 countries was something that we called a global finance and health board to be set up under the G20. But at the last hurdle, it was kiboshed by the Chinese, ironically by the WHO itself, uh, and by the World Bank. And that is at the core of why some of these global dilemmas continue, in my view. But that CGD paper is definitely worth uh, reading. Um, on some of the, uh, some of you, many of you probably heard me talk about the Ten Commandments, because one of the reasons why it was, it is so complex, was so interesting to do. There's all these different areas that need to be dealt with, and you sort one out, it makes others more complicated. So you have to do them all together. Uh, and the 29 specific recommendations we made covered these 10 broad areas. Um, there hasn't been uh, a lot of progress on many. On, on new basic university type research, of which this wonderful thing that Jim Ratcliffe is financing and David Sweetenham and, Sweetenham and Tim and others have set up, my impression is there is more of that going on, which is fundamentally crucial, of course. And with it, there was, there was more so-called push funding research coming through, but linked to how we stylized our recommendations, if you don't get the pull funding, then that starts to vanish and disappear. And that is a significantly growing problem, in my opinion. Um, vaccines, uh, with my, I, I meet with my old group at once a quarter because we got on such so well and we were all like having food and a glass of wine. Um, that's probably the main reason. Um, and we laugh about the experience post-COVID because one of the few, or one of the many things we picked up during our review is there didn't seem to be many people really interested in the vaccines business. And then something big rather happens and all these big guys think they're going to get a bit of a freebie from governments. And surprise, surprise, lots of people can produce vaccines. Uh, and in the spirit of never letting a crisis go to waste, uh, it seems to me we have to keep some of these great initiatives, a lot, of course, which started with what Oxford did, um, to keep all of that being applied to other places, such as drug-resistant TB and many other things. Uh, I think Tim probably doesn't agree with me about this, but in my view, also directly related to animals, um, because then it will be easy to switch it all back on when something like COVID, the next COVID or whatever it is, breaks through. But we need them for all these other things. Uh, and we found the role of vaccines to be bizarrely under-focused on in terms of trying to solve the whole issue. Uh, what else, very quickly? Um, three other final things, and I'll stop. Uh, somebody just said there had been nothing said about agriculture. Uh, so our support, and Pete Barriello, who was at the core of what the UK has done so well on it. Uh, I, to our surprise, when we have our drinks, six years on, the progress that's being made in agriculture is actually better than we thought would have been the case. Uh, and linked to slightly contradictory to the tone of something about the next generation and younger people. One of the reasons, certainly in the US, is because of changing consumer habits and the next generation. We call it the Shake Shack factor. When the burger uh, food entity called Shake Shack appeared on the scene, serving non-antibiotic fed stuff, there was, and this was happening, ju just began during our review. There was evidence that McDonald's and all the others were kind of freaking out at losing market share. So surprise, surprise, what do they start doing? Trying to create some of the same impression. And there's been, I think, Pete, something like a 20% drop in consumption of uh, antibiotics in agriculture in the US the past few years. Not at all what we would have expected. In addition, 
uh, and Tim is right at the heart of this and put me right in no way more than me, in some big emerging nations, particularly China, uh, Kalistin uh, has been banned. And we, still to this day, I don't understand why all lasting line antibiotics uh, are, are not banned across the developed world. It seems to me ludicrous that they aren't. Um, second last thing, diagnostics. Um, as an economist and finance person, the most thing, if I had to choose one of the things that we suggested as the most important is uh, getting these damn things at the start of, uh, in the middle of antibiotic uh, inappropriate prescription control. We live in a world where these stupid things completely dominate our lives. And yet we have doctors making constant educated guesses whether we need antibiotics or not. We need to get state-of-the-art affordable diagnostics right in the middle of our health systems. And then lastly, and very sadly, uh, the progress made on international collective focus on it, partly because of other things, uh, has not utterly collapsed, but it is collapsing. Uh, partly because of the US-China stuff, partly because of the G7 versus BRICS stuff, partly because of COVID, but of course there was a, a lot of G20 focus on AMR uh, on the back of our review, uh, and unfortunately it's disappearing. And we need uh, a Greta Thunberg, uh, and despite the fact he never realized it, a David Cameron that's not gonna be disappearing two years after he decided he wants to support it. I'll stop there, thank you. Jim, I thought you were the Greta Thunberg for uh, ah. antimicrobial resistance. We have time for a few questions. I wouldn't mind traveling around in the boats, she obviously uses. <laughs> I, I mean, I just, oh, sorry, Andrew Farlow. I just know the recent G20 announcement had quite a lot of AMR in it, and oh. indicating that there's a good opportunity to do something when India is in charge this year. Last and week's communique. A week or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And we're working with Guard P, WHO on, That's on a nice access. Surprise. And we want, we want to push it onto the agenda. So it's a, there is an opportunity coming, is my, my observation. Well, you know, I, what I really mean, I mean, there's words and action, right? Um, I think the 2018 G20 statement almost repeated verbatim virtually every one of our recommendations. But what does it mean? What are they actually going to do? Are they going to pay for Netflix models uh, around the world? Um, you know, what is the point of constantly talking about it? Totally agree. And, and on the national action plans, we had a demonstration earlier, lots and lots of ticking boxes, no sort of pushing through and implementing. So it, it is about, you know, using those opportunities to put real practical things. We're, we're working on a project on access to antibiotics. Dare I say so, in this regard, yeah. I can't never miss a chance to really annoy people in the pharmaceutical sector. How about pushing these guys to change their risk reward calculations? Yeah. I think <clears throat> you, can, you can see during COVID and the thing I mentioned about co uh, vaccines, seemingly things that they won't do when they see more dosh than they thought before. Surprise, surprise, they suddenly appear. Change the risk reward mentality of how these guys think. Make it harder for them to not be in the business. Thank you. Thanks. I would suggest. Final question for Jim over there. Hi, um, I'm Claire Chandler. I'm a professor in medical anthropology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and um, thank you very much for your talk and for the earlier talks today. Um, one thing that I'm wondering is, we've heard a lot, uh, first of all, this morning about how uh, there's a massive problem of AMR. Um, you were making the point that we really need solutions and we need to be doing things. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all recognize that there's, there has been a scientific gap in knowing what those solutions should be, what the effectiveness is, and so on. But the one thing I wonder is we heard about orchestrating from the WHO um, the response, but who is orchestrating and pulling together the science so that we know what the solution should be? And I wonder if you have a view on who should be doing that and how we best coordinate um, the scientific community so that we are advancing faster than we otherwise will be when we publish all over lots of different journals and it seems that there is not 
a single place that is pulling all of that together? I mean, I think probably my most honest answer is I haven't got a clue. Um, but I don't have a clue about most things and it's never stopped me from saying something. Um, uh, I'd say two other things. Or three. I'm slightly surprised by the tone of how you express that because if it's the case, it's really worrying. Um, second last thing is, isn't it dosh? Isn't it money? What, one of the, um, going back to our specific recommendations, one of the really startling things that was so easy to observe looking at the data is how many uh, research people seem to be particularly fascinated by oncology. Uh, and when you really delved into it, it was because it was, you know, where there's a lot of money flying around. So if you increase the incentives and remuneration for people doing this stuff, I suspect you might get more. And with it, if it's needed within the scientific community, some, some kind of collective better way of thinking. But my last comment is slightly contrary to, to the tone of your question is that one of the things that I think the WHO has done better as it relates to the AMR space is, is their list of priority pathogens, uh, including actually, I think, uh, Tim, again, you'd know better than me and others would, uh, also for vaccines as well as antibiotics in the past few years and, and some diagnostics. And they must have found a way of doing that, which I, I would, I'm assuming wouldn't be ignoring the scientific community. Um, and I think that is actually really a, a really powerful development. And from that, uh, we need um, really globally minded leaders from some countries to link that to the Netflix type model and get people out of bed to realize that, yes, the direct return from producing antibiotics might not increase your PE ratio, but if you carry on the way that it's going to be, the fact that you won't be able to do half the rest of the things that you make so much money out of, your PE ratio will collapse anyhow. But we need governments to change the psychology of some of the people with money around the space. Thank you very much indeed, Jim. My pleasure. <laughs>
And in 2016, we classified 16 countries as having a NAP, but no surveillance in operation. So these are low and middle income countries. And now in 2016, we're classifying 14 of those as having surveillance happening. Still gaps, not in any sense saying it's, per it's perfect, but surveillance is actually happening. And I think if you think that this is over the course of the pandemic, and this is negotiations, you know, active negotiations with, say, 20 governments, this is quite, quite an achievement. Now, Janet kindly saved my bacon by uh, explaining this slide earlier, um, that it, this is important because the AMR-related mortality rates are highest in the very countries where we're working in Africa and in South Asia. And clearly this data is model data and really the sort of whole purpose of the Fleming Fund is to have hands-on you know, surveillance data to uh, improve what we know about the AMR situation. Now, <clears throat> we've got a broad idea, we're doing more economics in phase two, but we've got a broad idea of how much surveillance uh, costs. And our sort of working figure is 2.5 million the average cost of operating a surveillance system for human and animal health, and then add on another 300,000K for environmental surveillance. Now, and obviously that, you know, that varies depending on the size of the country, on the, um, the structure of costs, but 2.5 million is a useful number to bear in mind. Now, I don't know what you think about 2.5 million. It might not sound like uh, too much. It's the budget for six months for the average UK uh, secondary school, but if you take every single penny that's spent in your average low-income country, total health expenditure, not government, people paying for themselves, all the health insurance, the out-of-pocket expenditure, that re represents every single penny for 86,000 people. You know, it's, it's in low-income country stands, this is an expensive intervention. If you just take government health expenditure, it's every single penny that is needed, that is available for 430,000 people. So it kind of looks like a cheap intervention. It's not for low income countries. And if you think that this is just only one of the many AMR interventions, it puts it in perspective. So do we think we're going to be sustainable? We've got 10 years funding, that's, that's pretty good. But actually, you know, imagine the logistics of setting up surveillance in all these countries, it's pretty tough stuff. Uh, clearly we're committed to sustainability, but we want to be realistic. The, the gold standard is to get it into, into government budgets, clearly. And there are examples of, of good practice. So for example, in Timor-Leste, they're gradually funding an increasing percentage of the consumables year on year, an increasing percentage. The other thing that we really want countries to do is to create the key posts and to fill the key posts because that's the thing that international agencies really can't do. That is the key thing, is the human resources. We're trying to get the, the necessary um, <clears throat> equipment for, for surveillance into essential drugs lists because that's kind of institutionalizing it. If you're on the essential drugs list, you're more likely to be bought. But, you know, come to the inescapable conclusion that really we have to think of AMR surveillance, maybe other aspects of AMR as a global public good. In other words, something, the information benefits us all. The information is kind of a bit intangible. It comes out slowly and the benefits uh, are realized slowly. And it's very unlikely that um, many countries will, will be funding this. So there's going to be a need for an international voice for uh, payments for a long time to come. Now, if I could just use the last couple of minutes to sort of move away from that kind of rarefied world of the economics of AMR surveillance and talk about the, the sort of more general marketplace. And what I mean by the rarefied world is, in essence, what the Fleming Fund is doing is it's subsidizing the diagnostic tests which patients and which farmers are accessing. And we've, we've already talked that that's not the norm. You know, patients are chatting to friends and family first, maybe having a few antibiotics, certainly not a full course. Uh, it's probably several weeks until they contact a, 
a professional. Um, the likelihood of them having a diagnostic test is very small. And we've just got to remember again and again, the antibiotic transactions in most of the world are commercial. They're not, they're not authored by a professional. They're a straight commercial, you know, can I afford six or seven of these pills or not? Now, what this slide tells us is simply that in the countries we're working, <clears throat> up to 75% of the money spent is out of pocket. Literally, you know, you go along to the doctor, uh, there's a fee, you take it out of your pocket and you pay cash. So, and what we know is that in the countries, so if you look at these countries here, why out of pocket, you could take Pakistan as an example. If you look at the light blue one, 2% of households every year are impoverished. So 2% of households fall back down below the poverty line because of health expenditure. And a good chunk of that is going to be antibiotics. You can be sure of that. So, you know, there are many reasons. We've talked about many reasons why we focus on, on AMR. And this, to me, is an important one of them, that without the diagnostic tests we've talked about, without antibiotic stewardship, you know, we're actually causing people to fall into poverty. So that message and the message that, you know, surveillance costs the entire government health budget for 430,000 people in uh, low-income countries. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Many thanks, Katrina. That was fascinating. Tim. Oh, Tim, could you wait for the microphone? Thank and you. And Katrina, uh, I think we need you back for the microphone just for the... So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let you escape in case you... You won't um, get lunch if you talk too much. Uh, this is true. Okay. If but you're doing well, we've got another five minutes. Oh, but, very, very quickly. Um, one of the issues with uh, in you know the, uh, the whole realm around who finances what um, seems to be the cost of diagnosis versus the cost of antibiotics. Diagnostics are very expensive even, you know, with something like simple like sepsis. Antibiotics are very cheap. And so therefore there is this um, argument to actually that not to do diagnostics, but actually just go to prescribing in a, in a fairly prophylactic manner. What do you think is the level, for example, looking at sepsis, particularly in low income countries, what do you think is the level, the cost level that we should be aiming for? Is it $5? Is it eight, is it 10? And how does the Fleming Fund kind of think about that as an economic model for when it's doing laboratory capacity building in LMICs? Yeah, good, good question, Tim. And I think, first of all, we mustn't forget that actually in international development circles, paying for healthcare is a controversial issue. And there are people, I'm not one of them, there are people who advocate that international development should not support any kind of healthcare for which there is a charge. And that is an active movement that we just mustn't ignore. And I'm not saying that the Fleming Fund is enthralled to that thinking because it's not, but it's, it's there. I would say, and I, I can't, I'm not sure that I can give you a dollar, but look here. When you charge 10 to 20% of the total, it's kind of okay, you know, that, that families can cope with that. It's not, it's not ideal, you've still got, got um, stuff happening. But 10 to 20%, 30%, no, 10 to 20% is kind of okay. So if you can somehow, you know, say in, in labs, cross-subsidize, cross so that, that um, rich people and the things that people are willing to pay for are making a bit of profit to pay for things, then I think you're on, you're on safe ground. But there's a lot of work to be done. And Fleming Fund 2 has got some funding, we hope, to be confirmed for sort of ad hoc studies of, of just this, you know, playing around with, with the numbers and seeing what actually works. Thank you. Is there a second question? Katriana, thank you very much okay. indeed. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Julie Robottom, who is Head of Modelling and Evaluation for Healthcare uh, Associated Infections and Antimicrobial Resistance at UK HSA, and has been very much involved in COVID modelling as a member of SPIM. Julie. 
thank you very much indeed, and thank you for the invite to speak here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about quantifying the economic cost of AMR. Uh, so just to confess up front, in this talk, I'm not going to give a single figure with a pound sign against it for how much AMR actually costs, but rather than that, talk about the challenges and where we need to go to enable us to quantify the economic cost. So first of all, I thought I should tackle why we might want to and whether this is even a good idea to try and estimate the economic cost. And if we're sufficiently convinced, think about how we might do that and where the various studies are now that create the building blocks to enable us to tackle this question and where we're still missing data, missing evidence and missing methods and where we need to go to next. So I'm hoping that this audience doesn't need much convincing that estimating the economic cost of AMR is a good idea, um, but it provides us with many things. So firstly, it helps uh, incentivize the development of new antibiotics, as well as the sustainable use of existing ones. It allows us to quantify a justified level of investment in control to help uh, promote rational decision making. And for any economic evaluation of uh, an intervention strategy aiming to tackle AMR, a prerequisite to being able to do that economic evaluation is knowing how much AMR costs. You can't value how, what the value of preventing something is if you don't know how much the thing that you are preventing actually costs. Okay, so if we want to go ahead and do this, how might we do it? It will come as no surprise that this is complex and there are a number of different challenges when thinking about costing AMR, uh, requiring lots of data needs and lots of novel methodologies. This really does represent a significant research challenge, one which has been gaining momentum in recent years, but there's still so, so much further to go, uh, still so much more to do. Firstly, which has been touched on already this morning, AMR is not in itself a disease entity. It obviously encompasses many different pathogens. All of those pathogens cause different infection types. They may be resistant to different antibiotics. They all cost something different and all have different health and cost consequences. All of those things will vary differently over time. They will respond to interventions differently and they impact populations differently. So those different complexities really do need to be considered. But that complexity has caused the vast majority of the literature to focus on single drug bug combinations. So most of the um, studies which estimate the cost of resistance focus on single drug bug combinations. A couple of examples here. So this study is looking at the cost of resistant E. coli bacteremia in English hospitals. Uh, the authors looked at the direct cost to the NHS of having a resistant bloodstream infection compared to uh, a bloodstream infection that was susceptible, so treatable with antibiotics. And they found this value to lie between 100 and 500 pounds per infection. So that's just the additional cost of that infection being resistant. And that varied depending on what it was resistant to. This study focuses on a different organism. So this is carbapenemase producing enterobacteriales. This is a particular threat at the moment due to development of resistance to our last line antibiotics. And this study estimated the cost of an outbreak of CPE uh, in an NHS trust, which came out at just over 1 million euros. So what's instantly obvious is that these two studies are doing very different things. One of them is looking at what's the additional cost of resistance in a bloodstream infection. The other study is costing the entire outbreak. So looking at the cost of the whole, whole infection, looking at actual expenditure and opportunity cost. So this brings me to a really important point, and this is key when trying to cost uh, resistance. Cost compared to what? So this study by Marlika de Krecker and Mark Lipsitch really discusses this really quite nicely. So there are two approaches you can take. Do you compare your resistant infection against a similar infection that's susceptible? So you're just looking at the additional cost of that resistance. Or do you compare the cost of your resistant infection against having no infection at all? These two counterfactuals will give completely different costs for AMR. Um, 
And this study argued that which of those approaches you take depends on the species, depends on the type of infection, depends on the intervention you're looking at. And they actually suggested using both approaches and that that forms an upper and lower bound and is most useful for policymakers. And that's exactly what the Graham study did. So I know Graham has been mentioned an awful lot today, so I won't go over it in any great detail, but they did a great job in looking at both of those approaches, forming an upper and lower bound, and thinking about those complexities across pathogen drug combinations, looking at an amazing 88 pathogen drug combinations using a wealth of data. It's an incredible undertaking. So just to very quickly go through their approach. So they looked at the overall burden of disease and quantified where this had an infectious cause. Where infection did play, play a role, they then distributed that to look at the different infectious syndromes. For each of those infectious syndromes, they then looked at what was the distribution of causative pathogens for those syndromes. And then with the burden due to each of those pathogens, they looked at what were the prevalence of resistance to different antibiotics was within those pathogens. And then estimated the excess risk of death for each of those drug-bug combinations, giving you then the burden for each drug-bug combination, which can then be combined. That simple plot really doesn't demonstrate the complexity and what went on within this work. So this is buried in the appendix of that paper, and I would urge everyone to go and look at it if you haven't already. But why am I talking about health burden? Well, to estimate the cost of AMR, you need the, the, the estimates of prevalence, and when you know how many drug bug resistant infections there are across different settings, what you then want to do is apply, apply a cost to these. So how much do each of these infections cost? And here I want to flag an amazing project that's underway at the moment. So this is a WHO piece of work where they're developing a value attribution framework. This is actually focused on um, estimating the economic value um, for using vaccines against AMR. But one of the key aims of this project is to do just that. So they are estimating the unit costs of resistances, thinking about how much uh, a resistant infection costs across different resistant types, across different syndromes, and across different uh, geographies. Within their cost, uh, they include the incremental healthcare system costs, but then they actually go wider than this to think about societal costs using a labor productivity cost model. So the intention for this, and what will hopefully be published later this year, is a user-friendly database of unit costs for those drug-bug infection combos. And then what we can do is apply these unit costs to prevalence studies like GRAM to really get a handle on AMR costs across different countries and for different drug-bug combinations. And this really will prove a huge leap forward compared to where we were before. So this is an incredible study. I've touched on it already, but another consideration is setting. How much does AMR cost? Cost, um, if, are you just considering infections in hospitals? Or are you going wider than this to think about the community as well? What geography are you thinking about? Is this cross country? Or are you coming from a One Health perspective? All of these have complexities. The vast majority of the evidence at the minute is costing uh, resistance in hospital <coughs> settings. This is where most of the data is. For hospital infections, um, the majority of the cost of a resistant infection in hospital can be represented by the economic value of the bed days that that resistant infection causes. So the key things that we need to estimate is the additional length of stay in hospital of a patient with a resistant infection and how much more likely they are to die. Of course, there are many, many methodological issues with estimating both of these key parameters. And so values in the literature vary wildly. So taking MRSA as an example, studies report anywhere between a three and 20 day increase in length of stay due to having that MRSA infection. That might not seem like too much of a big deal, but actually, that variability will really drive your overall estimate of cost of MRSA or cost of resistance. And that could make a difference when you're evaluating interventions to perform in hospitals, that will make a difference whether the intervention is deemed cost effective or not. 
But obviously we want to go beyond hospital infections. We need to take a wider perspective and consider AMR across the whole health economy. This is where we really hit some data needs. So the reservoir of AMR and the cost consequences of AMR in the community are really largely unknown. We need more granular data at an individual level, following patients from community through to secondary care, understanding their antibiotic use pathway. Consideration of morbidity, coming back to the discussions earlier about UTI, these can be really long-term consequences of these resistant infections, but there's a real scarcity of studies estimating the health-related quality of life impact of resistant infections. Most of them focus on mortality, but morbidity really needs to be quantified and costed and brought into the equation as well. As we've heard an awful lot about when we think about then going cross-country estimates or cross-sector estimates, this is where we really do hit data issues. And also the complexities of the system really come into play. So I'm not expecting you to be able to see this, but this is just a systems map thinking about all the different interactions between the different sectors. The vast majority of these interactions completely unquantified. I've touched on this already, but perspective is really important. Cost to who? Cost to patients, cost to healthcare providers, or cost to society more generally? A systematic literature review was conducted in 2018, looking at those studies that estimated the cost of AMR, and they looked at what methods they used and what perspective they took. Unsurprisingly, the conclusion was that the, the outcome varied varied enormously depending on what perspective. Um, so for example, health, excess healthcare system costs range from non-significance up to a billion dollars per year. What it also showed was that studies that took a societal perspective and thought about why the societal cost of AMR were in really short supply. So this is something we really need to focus on going forward. Finally, I just wanted to mention time scale. It's difficult estimating the cost of AMR currently, but actually for any intervention evaluation or estimated what the justified level of investment is, we need predicted future costs of AMR. This is extremely challenging and represents a real challenge for research. Predicting what those AMR trajectories across different resistances are going to look like is incredibly challenging. How different levels of antibiotic use is going to impact that, also challenging. Thinking about secondary effects. So we heard about surgical site infections earlier. Bringing that into play, if AMR levels reach a certain level, how much is this going to impact surgery or chemotherapy and being able to quantify that. We're developing mathematical models to help us do this, but much more needs to be done. So there's a lot of work underway um, to think about how we predict uh, future costs of resistance. And I would urge people to look at this science paper by our next speaker, actually, that thinks about creative approaches and what we can learn from other areas such as climate change. So I've talked a bit about where we are now, various studies and the building blocks for how we estimate, how we quantify uh, the cost of resistance, but where to next? This echoes a lot of what's been said already earlier, but we really need to focus on that missing data and the, the kind of surveillance systems across countries. Personally, I think we need a much better understanding of the reservoir of resistance in the community. Far too much focuses on the hospital populations. We really need novel methods. We don't really know how to quantify the societal value of antibiotics and um, the cost of um, resistance to society more generally. We don't know how to predict those tra trajectories into the future. Should we be doing that or should we be taking a completely different approach and learning from other sectors? And echoing earlier talks as well, we need to be brought together. Um, there's so many discrete pieces of work happening and they all need to be brought together. We need to work in a truly multidisciplinary way and bring together different areas of expertise to help us tackle this. Thank you. Julie, that was really fascinating and I'm really sorry, we're gonna to have to go on to the next talk, but there'll be a chance immediately afterwards, I'm sure, to ask questions. Uh, our next talk is from a member of the home team, Lawrence Roop, who is in the Health Economics Research Center at Oxford. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so the economic challenges of tackling AMR through innovation. So we've touched a little bit on innovation already today, and uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so just to say briefly, this talk draws very heavily on a perspective that I recently published um, on this topic. Um, so economic obstacles to, to drug innovation. Well, as I think we probably all know, from a drug company's perspective, most infectious diseases are a low margin business. Um, the second point on my slide is almost perhaps too obvious to state, but that is that almost without exception, with very rare exception, remuneration for drug companies is based on a prices times volumes model. Okay, so hold that thought because I think it's, it's really critical to the, the, the heart of the problem. Because of this, there may only be sufficient financial incentives to innovate, pr provi providing volumes, anticipated volumes, are going to be at a sufficiently high level, at a sum above break-even price, to provide a sufficient return on investment. And in fact, even relatively high sales volumes may not be enough if, if, pricing, if pricing isn't great. I want to just say a little bit briefly about patents as a backdrop, because of course the patent is very much the cornerstone of the traditional economic uh, model for discovery. It aims to provide incentives for innovation. Um, it does this where basically uh, the company that files the patent gets a monopoly essentially for a period usually of 20 years. Um, where it has uh, exclusivity to manufacture, market, and sell a drug, right? Um, and basically, from a societal perspective, we accept this monopoly. Of course, the monopoly allows the manufacturer to charge higher prices and perhaps sell a bit less uh, than would be the case if it was a competitive market. But we accept this, even though it gives us short-term reduced access to drugs and at a higher price, because of the incentives it provides for future innovation. That's the, that's the plan. Now, while this may work well for some drugs, unfortunately, in the case of antibiotics, it doesn't really solve the problem. Having a patent, having exclusivity does not equate generally to ability to make a profit. Um, and the reason for that is very much largely around this issue of volume. Whenever we develop a novel antibiotic, there's considerable pressure for us to hold that antibiotic back as far as possible, not to use it. Because of course, once we start using it, and the more we use it, the more selection pressure there is on bacteria to become resistant to this. We want to hold it back. It was suggested earlier about you know, banning colostin, for example, holding our last line antibiotics back. But the problem if you're a drug, a, a drug innovator is that, of course, you've invested a lot of money, research and development's expensive. You're remunerated, you're rewarded on a prices times volumes model. And if someone's going to try and stop you actually selling the volumes, then that's obviously a bit of a, a problem um, as an incentive. <laughs> And moreover, inevitably, the antibiotics will also ultimately have their own lifespan as resistance will inevitably begin to develop. And so this very much reduces the volumes that are going to be sold over the time horizon in which the company has a patent. And so patents have not unblocked the pipeline for antibiotics, as we know. And what it boils down to really, um, I'd say as an economist, is that this, the incentives that drug companies are presented with, uh, which is to make a profit missed, based on a prices and volumes model is just very, very poorly aligned indeed with the incentives of society, where actually we want novel antibiotics to be developed because of the health benefit that they're going to provide. Uh, Jim referred earlier to push and pull incentives. Um, I think absolutely critical. It's, it's, and I mean, it's not any news to anyone really that's worked in the area of, of economics of AMR, that we need both push and pull incentives um, uh, the pu push incentives referring to, you know, things like tax breaks, um, research grants, anything really that brings down the cost of research and development um, and increases the probability of success. Uh, but as Jim also said, pull incentives is really, I think, a very big, massive missing piece of the jigsaw here. Pull incentives are intended to ensure that once a, a safe and effective new antibiotic is developed, that there's going to be a sufficient revenue um, uh, and, and a, an attractive return on investment. <laughs> Um, and, and one which is attractive enough also considering you know, the, 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 the risk of failure in the R&D process. And this can only be achieved by delinking, and this is very widely recognized now, delinking the rewards for discovery from prices and volumes. Again, as has been mentioned earlier today, there have been some tentative steps towards subscription models, the so-called Netflix type model, if you like, that we've been trying in the UK. Um, where, where, in fact, it, you know, lump sum payments have been uh, made for two particular antibiotics, and 
in this case, the payment is completely delinked from prices and volumes. Instead, it's about the net health benefit that these drugs bring based on an analysis of, of the quality adjusted life years that they're going to bring, which includes, in fact, also their existence value and future costs of resistance to some extent. It's a, although it's a difficult problem, as we heard in the last talk. Um, but progress remains very slow. And that's, um, I, I think the main barrier probably isn't even necessarily um, you know, ass assessing the net health benefit, which is a massively challenging thing. But I think it, it's, it is this issue of funding is where is the money actually going to come from? So we can't have sufficient full, full incentives if we don't have pots of money that are going to fund them. And we've talked um, from Hanan's talk earlier, we talked about the, the importance of coordination um, in, in AMR generally. I think there's a big issue of coordination here on where this funding is going to come from. It's been estimated, for example, that for that the average <laughs> uh, estimated net present value for discovery of a novel antibiotic is somewhere around three billion US dollars. Now, to put that in context, where we're, we're testing our, our, net, our UK Netflix model at the moment, which is the first of its kind in the world, right? So it's, a, it's definitely a step forward. But we're, we're looking here at 100 million pounds over a 10 year period, which is, of course, a drop in the ocean beside the, the figures that, that really we need globally. So global coordination is needed. How could such a model actually work? Well, I'll come back to the funding side of it in a moment, but how, how could it actually work as a method? Well, some, one method which really appeals to me is the idea of the health impact fund. So the idea of the health impact fund is basically to create a global government funded agency, which offers yearly reward pools um, from which new drugs uh, will, will get a share for a fixed number of years, such as a 10 year period. So the idea is essentially the health impact fund has a certain amount of rewards that it's going to give out each year. Companies are asked if they'd like to register a drug with that fund, a certain number of drugs will be put forward. And then each year, an analysis will be done of the net health benefit, which those different drugs bring. And then each of those drugs and the innovators of those drugs will be given a reward in proportion to that drug's share of the pot in terms of that, its share of the net health benefits. It will get a proportional share of the pot. So of course, how much it gets depends on how much goes into the pot in the first place. But, but a stipulation, again, it's delinkage. Uh, the innovator in this case must agree to sell the drug at or below manufacturing cost. And in fact, it may well choose uh, potentially to sell below manufacturing cost because that might mean selling more volumes and getting a greater net health benefit, which is actually what it's rewarded for in this case, rather than uh, the volumes themselves. And they'd also be obliged to license uh, cost-free um, uh, for generic production after this 10 year period. How could it be funded? Well, countries could pay some percentage of their GDP. Um, perhaps that's most, the most realistic way of doing it. Ideally, from an economic point of view, I think the best way might be some sort of ring fence taxes that could be ag agreed globally um, and applied internationally. So this could be, for example, an airline tax. Um, I think crucially, the economic principle of taxing either the polluter pays or to tax a bad, generally taxing something we try to discourage. It could be carbon emissions. It could be destabilizing financial transactions, not unlike the idea of the Tobin tax. Um, so bringing the added benefit of um, reducing damaging activities. This definitely requires a lot of global coordination and it's probably, I think, optimum, but maybe more challenging. But either way, whatever way it's funded, the health impact fund would essentially be a global public good. It could benefit all of us taxpayers, patients, and indeed pharma companies by providing new, ince new, new incentives, new, new routes to rewards. I think something is crucial to say, although uh, coordination is very important, it's initiating the health impact fund requires political will, but it certainly does not need all countries to necessarily participate. It's been suggested, for example, around $6 billion per year might be a suitable amount. I think for context, that the last thing I would do in the world is to suggest that only Latin America and the Caribbean <laughs> should, be, should be financed this, but I think it, the, the, it puts the numbers into context. We could at least make a good start with $6 billion a year. That's 0.12% of, of that region's GDP. Of course, we should have high income countries involved and it's going to become a very small fraction of GDP. Manu there's um, this, this, this uh, also something to point out, this thing about the manufacturing cost price ceiling, the, the requirement to sell um, at cost or below. 
That would not apply when selling to any high income country, which is not part of the, which has not contributed to the health impact fund. So someone who signs up to the fund and gets their share of the net health benefits um, from their drug, they share of their pot that way. They can also sell at considerable markup to other high income countries that are not participating, which will give a further incentive for other high income countries to get involved and so increase um, the, the funds that are available uh, in the future. And this, by the way, is certainly not necessarily just for antibiotics. It's for other things as well. And I think notably so-called diseases of the poor that are uh, so often forgotten. Um, so if you've got you know, malaria, tuberculosis, leishmaniasis, and so on, um, these, these are also diseases which suffer because of the, the prices and volumes model, um, although for, for somewhat different reasons about the lack of ability to pay in low income settings. Um, so international cooperation to agree and commit to funding mechanisms. Um, there was a reference also to the analogies to climate change earlier, I think uh, in Otto's talk. Um, and again, coming, you know, to the coordination that's needed there, you know, perhaps we do need something like the Paris Agreement. I think something else we have learned from those challenges is that it's very hard getting that, um, getting global agreements and, and also people to uh, commit to act on the, the agreements that they make. But I think it's definitely not a sufficient condition that there's strong public support, but I think it was absolutely a necessary condition. So we need to get the public behind uh, to, to appreciate the value of something like the Health Impact Fund or, an, or some other mechanism for funding uh, drugs globally. Following the pandemic, um, I wrote this, this, uh, this perspective a few months ago before um, uh, things got even worse globally in many ways than they were before. Um, with um, you know, the war in Ukraine and so on particularly. Certainly when I, when I wrote my perspective, um, there was a heightened appreciation, I think, of the need for global health system resilience. Um, and I hope that that's still the case and that this, from a public attitudes perspective, gives us an opportunity to act. I'm involved in some multi-country survey studies at the moment of the general public. And it certainly was the case sort of about a year into the pandemic that this, this feeling was there, this willingness to pay um, for future resilience, high, to pay higher taxes, to support higher government spending. I'm gonna be shortly, very shortly, getting new data on that to see whether that's still the case currently. In any case, what can we do to bring about something like the Health Impact Fund? Well, there are active calls for a, um, a pilot um, to act as a demonstration. Um, and in this case, the idea is that there's a competition uh, uh, from existing ma uh, pharma manufacturers of existing drugs, so these are existing patented drugs, um, simply to, not to innovate them, of course, because they're already made, but to supply them, and to supply them in particular to countries, regions of the world where um, they're currently underused, and to do that at a price which is anticipated to be at or below future generic pricing. And again, they would get rewards based on the net health benefits from actually supplying these existing drugs. So this would be a way of beginning to get um, to, to create the fund. And the main barrier really is, again, uh, money. It's a, bit, it's a bit sad looking at it, to be honest, you know, 60 million to $200 million. It's not an awful lot of money that's needed to get this pilot up and running. I think it's a fantastic idea. So um, maybe, I don't know, those who have influence in the room, um, if you think this is a good idea from a point of view of either funding or, um, you know, getting particular drugs involved in this, I think it's a way to do something great. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Lawrence, and uh, some really interesting ideas there. We have time for a single question, if someone would like to ask. Otto, <coughs> if you could wait for the... Thank you for a very, very stimulating talk. You know, in 2009, Swedish, Sweden has the EU presidency, uh, and there was an expert conference on, on, on uh, how the public sector needs to intervene in, in antibody development. Now Sweden has a presidency again next year, and the same topic will come up in the next conference and in a high-level meeting. Things has happened on the way. But after the first conference, we had the EU projects. They were short, but really important. But the infrastructure is lost because they were time-bound. So my question to you is really difficult. But what, what kind of, I like this very much. What kind of advice would you give to me to, to promote to the next conference we have in 2023? What is the most important thing that governments to take on board? With regard to the, this, this, this particular public health impact fund, um, I think um, I think uh, really, you know, pointing out that the 
the reason the, dis the drug discovery that we need is not happening is because this money just isn't there, that there's a very feasible system, a very feasible system for making it happen. It requires, at this stage, relatively small commitments, and we'll get massive outputs from it. Um, and that by getting involved, um, by getting involved, it will create incentives for other countries to join in, because in some sense, they'll be left out by not being able to take advantage of drugs which emerge from it at cost price. Thank you very much indeed, Lawrence. Thank you. Our final, our final speaker today is Anita McBain, who is a managing director for ESG at Citibank Research. Um, and it's a particular pleasure to introduce Anita, who is a good friend and has done a lot of work with the Martin School on other topics. Thank you very much, Charles. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I'm hoping we can bring a slightly different perspective today. Um, as Charles mentioned, I'm head of ESG research at Citigroup. And together with my colleagues in the room here, Amy Thompson and um, Andrew Pitt, we've published a lot on the growth in responsible investment. So the premise of my presentation today is we're witnessing right now, or is it working? <coughs> we're witnessing a real growth in responsible investment. We're starting to see a lot of scrutiny now on investors. How are they deploying capital to address climate change, to address biodiversity loss, but increasingly to demonstrate the societal impact or the environmental impact? So it's a pleasure to be at the end of the day here, actually, because listening to some of the talks today where they've talked about the societal burden, the social cost of antibiotics is really important. So let me just get these slides back up again. So this first slide here just charts the growth that we're now seeing in responsible investment. Approximately 35 trillion now in responsible investment allocated to responsible investment strategies that seek to tackle environmental, social and governance issues. 2022 has been a really important year for ESG as a strategy. There's a lot more scrutiny now on investors. Are they part of the problem or are they part of the solution? So we're certainly seeing now that the key drivers here for investors, yes, regulation, yes, asset owners, pension funds, but also society and NGOs. So investors are now under a lot of scrutiny to demonstrate the credibility of their investment thesis. How are they deploying that capital? And as we get to the end of 2022, we're going through something that we're calling actually an ESG, ESG stress test. We're seeing a lot of investors now having to really evidence the engagement process and the outcome of that engagement with their investee company. The reason I bring this into the room today is because the work that we've done on antimicrobial resistance, I've been looking at this topic myself, actually, since 2018, when I first heard Dame Sally speak, is it falls within the realms of responsible investment. We think about tobacco, for example, and the deleterious impact that has on human health. We now need to start thinking, as an investor community, of the economic cost, the burden on society, if we don't develop new antimicrobials. And also, just coming out of the COP27 talks, I was there a few days ago in Egypt, they talked again about this food, energy, water nexus. We've always adopted that at City in how we think about research. And we put right at the heart of that concept what we call our risk to resilience nexus. So it was really interesting to hear your presentation just now as you talked about resiliency. So what investors are trying to do is identify investment solutions that deliver resilience in the food system, resilience in the energy system, resilience in the climate system, ecosystems, but increasingly now in our healthcare systems. So it's no surprise that we actually put social inequality, health and well-being, and AMR at the center of this nexus. And this is really resonating now with our investment community. We know that climate change, for example, will be one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss in the decades to come. But understanding these interconnectivities, 
by building resilience into our ecosystems, they can be part of the solution in tackling climate change. But we also need to understand how increasing climate change is a driver of extreme weather events. And with these extreme weather events, floods, droughts, hurricanes, how does that lead to pathogen transfer? How does that lead to infectious disease transfer? How does that lead to the use of antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance? It's also important to note that we've got sovereign risk on there as well. Again, coming out of the talks in Egypt just last week, there's a role here for the developing nations. We know that, for example, when it comes to food and food resilience with the changing climate, this can pose a real risk to the food system. We've got extreme stress now in our food system. But how does this affect a sovereign? How are sovereigns thinking about that antimicrobial resistance issue from a sovereign perspective? We know it's transboundary. So it's no, it's no accident that we've got sovereign risk on there. And we're looking at these interconnectivity of all of these issues. So why is AML an issue for responsible investors? Well, climate change is the defining issue of our time, and it's deeply interconnected to food, to our climate systems, to our biodiversity loss, and also to human health and well-being. The climate crisis has increased these instances of extreme weather events. We know that we're starting to see in the literature, we're starting to draw some connectivities here. But why is it an investment consideration? The pressure now on investors to demonstrate their fiduciary duty, their understanding of the future risks to their business, to the companies that they're investing in, and how well have those companies understood these future risks? If those future risks are climate related, cyber related, biodiversity related, supply chain, modern slavery, or health related. That's the question now that investors are having to answer. Have you understood the risks? Are you engaging with your portfolio companies? And what's the outcome of that engagement? So we see the mobilization of the investor community equipped with the right framework, equipped with the right questions to start engaging actively with companies in the pharmaceutical company, in the sector, in the food sector, in the companies that produce antibiotics for livestock, bread for human consumption, in diagnostics, even in the enzymes now that are being used as part of food production. We even heard from one of the companies that I met last week in, in the COP talking about how they're actually developing new enzymes to give to animals to improve their health, to reduce their reliance on antibiotics. So we're certainly seeing that the investor community is receptive and they're willing to engage with the right framework. And as a result of that, we've also got companies now stepping into this debate they know that their investor community want to understand their environmental, their social and governance issues. So what we've also witnessed, and I'll come to this in my next slide, is the upskilling that we're starting to see within investment teams and within the corporates. We actually conducted a survey earlier this year that tried to understand how our investors approaching topics around climate change, biodiversity loss. And this is a frontier theme, actually, for investors. And in 12 months, or if I could even say 18 months, we've witnessed a real evolution now within the investment space. When we put this survey together, over 150 respondents, 90% are actively engaging on climate change. That wasn't the case five years ago. 78% see this as being, as to see financial materiality as being a key driver. Now that's a really important point to dwell on. And it's brilliant actually hearing some of the presentations earlier today. When you get to the crux of what is financially material for an investor, then you're really talking their language. And when we can actually start to attribute the societal cost, the societal burden, what does it mean for these increased hospitalization? What does that mean to society? And how can investors be part of that solution? It becomes a really engaging conversation to have. Excuse me, I'm running this off my phone today. And other findings from this research were also that, again, they're starting to integrate issues around biodiversity loss. This is completely new. This wouldn't have happened five years ago, even two or three years ago. 
So this is really to chart the evolution that we're seeing within the investment community. So AMR is a frontier theme for responsible investment. As part of our research on desk, we actually looked at the public disclosures that investment firms had made specifically on AMR. You can read some of the quotes here. These are off public websites. What particularly caught my attention here was AMR seems like a formidable opponent, but there are chinks in the armor. That's from one of the investors we looked at. And looking at the SDGs, so it would be remiss of me not to talk about the SDGs as a really comprehensive framework that's been used to contextualize and communicate a lot of the long-term sustainable outcomes. There is no long-term su sustainable development if we do not address antimicrobial resistance, but equally climate change, equally biodiversity loss, these are overarching and deeply interconnected. So it's very clear to us, I mean, I speak to investors every single day, that there's a receptivity to try and understand, one, what the financial materiality is, two, how do they mitigate this risk, but the next question is, well, what do the solutions look like? How do we invest in the solutions? So on this point here, the reason we're getting so many questions is we're starting to see this emergence of a science-based mindset within investment teams. I know I'm speaking to a very scientific or academic audience here today, but the people that we come across, that we meet, that we sit across the table from today in investments, they're, they're asking us hundreds of questions. We're sitting across the table from ecologists, from climate scientists. So it's not going to be long before the investment team of the future has sitting inside it an individual who understands microbiology, understands this threat. So we need to be prepared for that. Corporates need to be prepared for that. And investment teams need to be skilling up. And actually, I do have a, quite a few um, investors that very kindly um, joined the session today here in the room. So in summary, city research, you know, we believe that we've uncovered a nexus or an epistemic community of investors that are really keen to engage now in these issues, these responsible investment issues. Let's not forget, ESG has been through a massive reset this year. Coming out of the end of this year, there's a lot of focus now on the credibility and the evidence of an investment thesis that claims to be responsible, has these ESG credentials. Investors are now focused on these, these topics such as climate resiliency, biodiversity loss, but increasingly they're looking to academic research as well. This was a surprise finding for us. The policymakers, the UN, the IPCC, they don't always write for investors in mind. So I'd just like to put that to the audience as well today, that there is a demand for literature, academic literature, written for the financial sector. There, there is an insatiable demand for this sort of um, writing. We're also starting to see innovation. So again, for us as analysts, you know, what do the solutions look like? We've heard a lot about diagnostics, we've heard about surveillance, we've talked about enzymes that can be added to food. So we're really excited about this. We're really excited about where the investment solutions exist. Where can investors direct their capital flows to, be, to actually mobilize and be part of this um, effort? And also we're seeing regulation. And the regulation now has been catalytic for investors, demanding greater disclosure, transparency, traceability, evidence in that they've actually engaged with these portfolio companies. And this word on resilience, resilience is a key word for us. How resilient are our climate systems, our financial systems, our energy systems, our healthcare systems? That's really resonated once again with our investor community. So it's been an absolute pleasure to be here today. I'm really conscious, I know, and see watch checking, but I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Anita, and we had the added benefit of meeting your dog as well. Which oh, was nice. did my dog come <laughs> uh, We have time for one question. Jim. I, I wish we had another 15 minutes. So congratulations to Citibank for doing this, but this, this is something that we try to push in our review, obviously given my own background. But here, here's the real thing you've got to do. You've got to get your pharmaceutical analysts to start considering applying a discount to their rating of the pharmaceutical firms because 
at the core of, of much of this, all these guys trade at a premium to other sectors for a start. And they only really, one of the very few enthusiastic big pharma players happens to be privately owned. You know, have you got a plan to sort these characters out? <laughs> um, thank you very much for the question. I have to hand it over to our global head of healthcare. That's really the best way to respond to that. So that's... Um, and you are your healthcare guys. They're, yes, they are. I mean, we worked very closely with them to write the report that we're hoping to publish next week on AMR. They've contributed to the report. They, I've got a nickname with the healthcare team because of the work I'm doing with AMR. So, um, yeah, they're engaged. And the, but actually, it's the diagnostics team. It's our med tech team that we're really starting to try and find the solutions with. And also the team that are looking at enzymes, food, additives to reduce that burden. It's that injudic injudicious use in livestock, bred for, that's probably the bell, isn't it? Um, bred for human consumption. So we do have a lot of work with our chemicals teams, our food systems teams, our med tech teams. Thanks, Anita. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers today, and I am sorry that I've had to be so strict with time, but we are going now to lunch at Bailey, and we just have to be there by half past. If you go out the door and head towards uh, down the road, there'll be people there. Just before you do that, could I ask you to return your badges? And could I ha say a couple of thank yous? Firstly, to the people who set today up, the team from the Martin Group, Sharon and her team. <laughs> oh. Also, the wonderful triumvirate of David Sweetnam, Tim Walsh, and Chris Gofield, who are behind everything that we've had here. But most of all, to the people who have put their faith in the work we're doing here from INEOS. Um, you'll have heard from the Vice Chancellor last night, from Chaz this morning. We really, really do appreciate the confidence you've had in the university. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.